Welcome to Garden Success with Skip Richter, the show designed to help you have a bountiful garden and a beautiful landscape. Call in now with your lawn and garden questions at 979-845-5689 or email your questions to gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And now, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist, Skip Richter. Hello and welcome to Garden Success. We are looking forward to another show where we get to talk to you. Uh, that's the thing I enjoy most about the, the show is being able to visit with gardeners and hear what your questions are uh, or even hear you bragging about whatever plant you grew tomato this summer, whatever it was. Uh, it, let's, let's just do it and have some fun. Our phone number is 979-845-5689, 845-5689, or by email at gardensuccess at tamu.edu, gardensuccess at tamu.edu. Well, let's see. What are we going to talk about today? First thing, I think what we'll talk about is the weather. Um, we are finally getting into that kind of winter pattern uh, of our highs and lows that are kind of typical. And then here comes cold front now and then to, to really send us down into some truly cold weather. There's a forecast coming up next week uh, where it's down in the 20s uh, and pretty far into the 20s. Uh, depending on whether that holds true or not, I think it is certainly behooves us to talk about, you know, what uh, what do we do to prepare for it? Because uh, probably we won't have another show before we actually experience it. Uh, cold weather is a challenge to our plants uh, when, especially when they're from uh, climates that are not typically as cold as we can get here. Uh, an ex example of that uh, would be a fig tree. We had an email question from Matt uh, about a fig tree. It's a young tree, about two feet tall, planted back in October. Uh, and what happens when it gets into the 20s with a fig like that? Well, uh, figs are generally um, fairly cold sensitive for, you know, it's not just a plant and forget tree here. Now, having said that, I see established figs doing amazing things. Uh, there was even a few when we went down into single digits uh, that were in protected locations, well-established trees, that the die it, they were killed back some, but they even had some above-ground tissues that survived it. Typically, when we get a really cold uh, time, the figs are going to get killed back to the ground or near to the ground, and then they re-sprout from there. But when you have a brand new plant, uh, such as this new fig, uh, it's not really well established at all. And that goes true for a lot of other plants that normally would be hardy enough, but not when they're not established. Uh, we want to do some things to protect them. Uh, there is a, a number of things we can do. Uh, first of all, uh, you can uh, put a uh, mound of mulch up against the trunk of the tree. Uh, it, and uh, in this case, maybe make it up a foot or, or higher uh, and then leave it for the cold weather and pull it back when the weather warms out. Uh, that would be, and when I say mulch, I, actually I was thinking about soil or compost, but uh, if it's compost, then you can just spread it around and, and now you've added some compost to the surface around the tree, which it will enjoy. Uh, I've seen people take a wire mesh that will hold leaves, so not a not hog wire, but you know, little small, smaller than that. Uh, maybe put about a four foot circle around the tree and pile all the leaves you can get in it. And if they're somewhat shredded up, it's even better. And that massive mulch will protect, uh, you know, pretty well, uh, pretty far up above the ground when you have a mass like that. So a little two foot tree could easily be covered with a bunch of shredded leaves and that would get it through. It doesn't need light in the winter anyway. Uh, and I think that would be a way to protect uh, for perennial plants. You know, we have we have some perennials that are not always perennial here. Uh, an example would be the red bird of paradise, uh, Sesalpinia pulcherima, the red bird of paradise will die to the ground for sure and sometimes it, it's a little worse than that. So what we do with things like that is we mound up uh, some mulch over the base of the plant with a good mound. Uh, we can go ahead and print it back to the base because on those I'd recommend printing them to near the ground every year anyway. 
and uh, when when you have done that you pretty well are good for the winter and that plant will will stay and survive uh, there are other examples of plants that are marginally hardy um, the uh, golden showers or thryallus or excuse me thryallus let me start with that one thryallus is a uh, very beautiful plant blooming all through the year but it can take a cold and go back to the ground it almost always comes back but if you mulched over it just as an extra measure that would be that would be good also the golden dewdrop is what i was trying to say a while ago golden dew, dewdrop is duranta and duranta is not fully hardy here i most of the time you're going to be okay depending on the location and of course how cold it gets and how long it stays cold uh, but again mounding over the base so those are all recommendations for those kinds of plants now people come up with all kinds of ways to protect plants during the cold and I want to comment a little bit about that but first I'm gonna go to the email and answer a question by the way our phone number 845 5689-845-5689 or by email at gardensuccess at tamu dot edu gardensuccess at tamu dot edu uh, Catherine asked, uh, emailed me about uh, when to plant bulbs. She had some bulbs that she didn't know if she should store them uh, and, or go ahead and plant them. And we plant most of our bulbs in mid to late fall mid fall being a great time uh, and that would include the natural that would be primarily our naturalizing bulbs a lot of the some of the daffodils some of the paper whites uh, the oxblood or schoolhouse lily that blooms uh, in the fall when kids go back to school hence its name um, actually we go to school earlier than that now but anyway you get the idea uh, the lycoris there's a number of lycoris that do uh, pretty well here rain lilies bloom off and on all through the summer and and they could be planted you know in the from now all the way into spring uh, but all those bulbs we try to get them in then then there are a few bulbs that are one-shot wonders uh, you know we don't expect them to naturalize and that would be almost every tulip. Uh, there are actually a couple that are pr pretty tough here, and uh, but they're not going to be the kind you typically find in the mass marketing. Uh, you'd have to go to a specialty place. Uh, then another example would be hyacinth. The hyacinths are not uh, uh, typically bulbs that are going to stick around, although the little tiny grape hyacinth can. Uh, but in general, the big flowered hyacinth uh, crocus, uh, all kinds of things like that. And those we store in the refrigerator and plant them really in, I would say, late December to early January. Uh, the tulips are so cold tough that they actually think winter's over here with the kind of weather we tend to get. They're going to come up and, and bloom, and as the weather gets warm, they just can't tolerate that, and they don't last very long. The petals fall apart, fall off. Uh, so, but those I would put in the refrigerator and store them. Just make sure when you store them, you don't put them in the same bin that there's apples. Apples give off ethylene gas, and that uh, will mess up the bulb, believe it or not. Uh, and so don't store them, especially a long time uh, around apples if you happen to have those in the fridge. Well, let's go back. Let's go to the phones. Our number 979-845-5689 and talk to Chris. Hello, Chris. Hi, Skip. Um, I got a weird one for you today. Oh, good. Nope. That, that sounds fun. <laughs> um, I'm looking to grow some Drosera, some of the sundews to control fungal mats, and I figure the clay soil around here would be perfect. It's acidic. It'll hold moisture well. Uh, but I'm, they usually do better in nutrient-poor soil. Do you have a good way to strip nutrients out of uh, clay soils? No, there's not. Um it is an unusual question. I, I've i never heard of those growing outdoors in this environment. Typically, they're... Oh, it'd be indoors, sure. Oh, indoors. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. Well, you wouldn't have a, so much of a clay indoors. I You could create maybe, a, um, I don't know, a surface uh, kind of covering that, I don't know how deep it would have to be, that would be a poorer condition like a sand or whatever, but... 
Mm. Uh, I am not an expert on those. You know, those kind of specialty plants, the Venus flytrap and the sundews and and mm -hmm. uh, some of those little pitcher-like plants that catch bugs as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Those are a real fun hobby, but boy, I tell you, I've never heard of using those for fungal na fungus gnats, but I guess that would work. Have you have you read about people doing that? Uh, yeah, I'm I'm trying to get more into some of the carnivorous plants, and I everywhere I'm reading, they're saying yeah, they sundews do great for picking up the fungal gnats. You know, I would expect there's probably some plant society or or some. A place that sells those kind of uh, tropicals, insect mm. insectivorous uh, plants that uh, might have some advice on that. That's going to be outside my expertise, uh, but okay. I am fascinated by those. Uh, I think that's really really interesting. Uh, have you been growing dew drops or excuse me, sun drops for a while? No, I'm looking to kind of get into it. And I like to use stuff that's around, so I yeah. figured I'd try and use them in so, so it, place. Okay, so it's not like you tried and they died and tried and they died, because that happens with a lot of plants when we are trying to figure no, them not, out. No, not yet. Okay, good. Well, that is good. Wow, Chris, uh, you got me on that one. Um, oh. Well, I would, I'm, I'm kind of curious, no, that's okay. I it, Now you're going to have me go learn something else. Uh, I would uh, I would like to know more about what they need. I didn't realize that they need a nutrient pour. I would think they could grow in, you know, kind of a some sort of a potting mix, but that just without nutrient added. I know that mm. peat, for example, is, there's essentially no nutrients that plants are going to get out of peat, at least in in the reasonably mm. long term. Uh, yeah. So and maybe stay wet and acidic. So yeah, it stays true. moist, which they would like, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so I might do a little peat heavy mix, but okay. are you talking about putting a plant next to your other house plants? Oh, I mean, you know how you have your windows that are just full of your pots, and mm -hmm. I figure I'll have them in a similar area. Yeah, well. Um, other than the fun of a sundew, uh, the fungus gnats can be controlled with a specific type of Bt, which is an organic product. Mm -hmm. Normal Bt kills caterpillars, uh, but there mm -hmm. is a Bt for fungal gnats, fungus yeah. gnats, and oh my gosh, not Kursaki, maybe Israeliensis, uh, that may okay. be the one for mosquitoes. Do you happen to know? I don't. I oh, okay. Uh, dig into that one. Yeah, but there is a BT, which is a you know very essentially non-toxic or organic type thing that would help control those nuts too. As would uh, not not watering as much or putting mm -hmm. something on the surface that stays dry, like a I don't know. You don't want to put mm -hmm. gravel around every, all your little house plants, but something where the surface is not staying moist. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> well, call back and tell me how these things do and, and what you learned sometime. I'd, I'd like to hear that. <laughs> Will do. Thank you. All right. Thank you for the call. Our number, 979-845-5689, 845-5689, or by email at gardensuccess at tamu dot edu, gardensuccess at tamu dot edu. Uh, I could see how that would be a fun indoor plant uh, hobby, uh, growing uh, carnivorous or insectivorous, if you will, uh, plants that, uh, like the Venus flytrap being, I guess, the most famous that, to the general public. Uh, but uh, you could have a little uh, aquarium that is uh, turned into a terrarium uh, and grow some pretty cool stuff. I like that. All right, uh, let's see. We were talking about um, cold protection. And I mentioned there was something else I wanted to add to it. And and that is um, the, the, the whole idea of protecting our plants against cold is essentially keeping the temperature of the tissues that would be killed above their lowest tolerable temperature. So, for example, 
there are plants that can go down to 26 degrees pretty good but you get in the low 20s and they're in trouble so all you would need to do is keep those into the upper 20s or low 30s and, and you're good in other words it could be below freezing and they're still okay there are other plants that get down in the 40s and get real unhappy and uh, so we wouldn't want to take those kind of plants and keep them even warmer than that which is pretty much impossible outdoors uh, in the winter time here but what we do is again I, I want to stress that because we're not necessarily keeping them from freezing we're keeping them from getting colder than they can handle uh, and there's a publication online all almost all the AgriLife publications are at a website called agrilifelearn.tamu.edu t-a-m-u dot e-d-u agrilifelearn one word and you can go there and do a search and if you go there and do a search for frost and freeze those, put those two words in frost freeze uh, you will get a publication that uh, Dr. Um, Mani Nesbitt and uh, I put together. Uh, it's uh, all about protecting plants from cold and from uh, uh, freezing temperatures. And you will find there are a number of different strategies that you can use. And the most common strategy uh, is to cover the plant. So that could be an old bed sheet if it's a small plant. It could be a large uh, clear plastic. It could be a tarp uh, put over the plants. You'll often hear, uh, don't let plastic touch the leaves because it'll the frost and freeze can burn the leaves there. And that's true. But if you're trying to save a citrus tree, it is an acceptable loss to lose the leaves that are touching the plastic on the outside uh, if you protect the whole tree. So I, I wouldn't let I wouldn't take that plastic concern too far. But yes, aesthetically that that is going to be a problem that's going to happen. Uh, but when you cover a plant, you want to cover it to hold the soil heat in. So instead of um, cut, wrapping it up like uh, a landscape lollipop. Uh, you want that cover to drop to the soil. And I've talked about this before, but I know we have different folks that listen at different times. Uh, but drop all the way to the soil and then secure it to the soil. That may mean covering the edge with soil, if that's practical for the site. It may mean setting cinder blocks or whatever, uh, logs on the edges, whatever holds it down. Because sometimes we get cold and we get a breeze, and those are especially difficult cold snaps to protect plants during because it is essentially super cooling or cooling rapidly I should say uh, the plant tissues and there there's just uh, it we lose a lot more uh, plants in that kind of cold than in a very still cold night the plastic can keep the air from moving through the soil on a cold night radiates its warmth relative warmth that is upward toward the sky and that warmth that's being radiated upward uh, can help protect the plant underneath the plastic cover. Uh, soil, you know, maybe 50 degrees in the soil or even a little lower and you're still getting some warmth that's, that's coming up from the soil. If you have bare soil, that's even better because it really warms up when the sun shines uh, during the day. Uh, when that's not enough, and it often is enough, by the way. In our vegetable gardens, it's usually enough because we're growing cold, hardy vegetables in winter. We're not growing a tomato in the winter. Uh, but in, in, uh, if that's not enough, then we can add a source of heat underneath the cover. And how we do that is really important uh, because uh, when you add electricity and you have an extension cord and a plug and a bunch of dry grass, there's a lot of things that can go wrong, as you can imagine there. So we want to be very careful with those electrical connections. We also uh, want to be aware of the fact that uh, our heat source can damage the plant if it, if it heats it up too much. So if you used one of those uh, infrared heat lamps and you put it you know, a few inches away, shining right on the trunk of your citrus tree, you're going to get some, some damage. Uh, on the tree from that. So you want to use your light uh, and point it downward and generally you don't need to use an infrared heat lamp because all we need is a few degrees typically uh, to protect 
And so we could use a 150 watt or 100 watt incandescent bulb. You can put them in one of those plastic, or, or excuse me, aluminum shields uh, that has a clamp on it. So you can attach it to something, you know, the kind I'm talking about. Uh, and I'm, by the way, another reason I'm talking about this this week is because if you go try to find one of those for sale uh, the night before the freeze next week, you're, you're going to find they're gone already. So here's your chance. But anyway, one of those aluminum shields clamped onto something could be clamped onto a branch of the tree or if the plant's real small, maybe the trunk of the tree would be fine or shrub and point it toward the ground. Uh, just don't, you know, you don't want to heat up the branch so much. You just want to warm and get some warmth coming up out of it. And it'll do that, and it'll make a huge difference. I've not tested how far down you can go, but you can go a long way in terms of temperature. If you've got a still air space, wind can't displace that warmer air, and uh, you've got the, the cover over it. Uh, you can protect a lot of things. So keep that in mind. For most people, that is not what they're going to have to do. Uh, some of you are fortunate enough to have a nice little citrus tree in the backyard or something else worth protecting. Uh, but most people are going to throw blankets and sheets over, and that's just fine because it accomplishes the same thing. The other thing that happens with like a blanket or a sheet is uh, frost forms when the surface of whatever is down there, the, the ground, uh, radiates its heat out and the temperature of the grass underneath or around your landscape, the temperature of the surface leaves of whatever plants you have actually get colder than the air around them because that radiated heat allows the tissue to drop colder. So it's not just the temperature of the air, it's the additional fact that that tissue drops down because it's up on top exposed to the, the sky uh, and on a, on a cloudless cold cold night that radiates heat out and frost, moisture from the air forms on that plant. And that is what uh, causes that frost damage. Uh, and it's interesting because if you have like, uh, when we have a frosty night, the next morning you're early driving around town, look where there is an evergreen tree like a live oak. And look at the ground and the yard. And what you'll see is the yard has frost on the ground, the grass, but underneath the live oak tree with that canopy that is re not, it's reflecting radiant back down again uh, and protecting that, it you don't have the frost form there. So that's another thing that a blanket can do. Uh, it can protect uh, that frost formation. Now again, if you're trying to protect uh, uh, some plant that uh, you don't want to lose the outer leaves on, uh, the plastic is not going to be a good way to go. Something that, that I do and a lot of people do is make a frame around the plant. Uh, if you've got a citrus tree, you're going to be protecting it for years. And so make a frame that you can store and get back out again. One of the easiest ways to do that is to use PVC pipe. There's a lot of fittings that you can use with PVC to create a frame. You want a pretty sturdy PVC, at least an inch uh, in diameter, uh, to make that frame bigger is even better. Uh, I sometimes will just make arches over and it sort of creates an igloo looking structure. So that would be another option for that. Some people build them out of wood, out of 2 by 2s or 2 by 4s 2 by 2s usually enough, uh, and they create their box out of that. And then they just bring it out when it's winter time, get it set up. So on a cold night they can throw something over it and then they're done. Uh, they're done with that. So anyway, those are some tips on uh, cold protection. Uh, get ready ahead of time to, to do the kinds of protection you need to do. You will see a lot of other options out there uh, that, that people use or that typically commercial uh, folks use uh, in, a, in an orchard, uh, such as spraying water out on the plant. That is a whole nother monster, perhaps one just out of curiosity we can talk about. But let me just, let me cut to the chase and say, don't spray water on your trees. Ice does not protect them. It doesn't. It's, it's the transformation from liquid to solid that protects them. Uh, and so you can have, if you have icicles all over your branches and plants and uh, you stop spraying water, 
uh, it is going to just get as cold as it's going to get. And, and in fact, and the next morning when it starts to melt, uh, it'll get colder inside. Uh, the inside is that Remember I mentioned that the liquid changed to solid, uh, that process provides a little warmth. Solid changing to liquid removes a little warmth. And so you can supercool the inside of those ice-covered plants and supercool their buds uh, the next morning. So don't use water. There's other issues with it, uh, breakage of branches, soggy, wet conditions that take forever to dry out. Don't do that. But there are ways we can protect our plants. Uh, I want to go back to the email. And uh, by the way, our phone number is 845-5689, 845-5689, uh, or by email, gardensuccess at tamu.edu. Gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And Ann asks a question that I think is a, is a great question. It, it's one that... Uh, that uh, I need to really talk about. And that is, how do you set up a system for starting seeds indoors so you do it successfully? In other words, how do I grow a good, stocky, healthy transplant inside? Uh, because once we get to about January, we're going to be somewhere in there uh, starting seeds for our peppers and our tomatoes and other things. And they'll have to spend some time indoors uh, before they're, it's safe to plant them outdoors. Well, first of all, the number one problem that we have in trying to grow transplants is a lack of quality light. Now, our eyes see light, uh, the, the um, um, wavelengths and things uh, are, are pleasant even when the wavelengths are not suitable for plants. So we can have cool, warm, a uh, cool light, warm, warm light, uh, you know, from the blue to the red uh, spectrums uh, and create all kinds of different settings inside the house or moods, if you will, uh, in, in the house uh, for different purposes. But the, the plants themselves need light primarily in the blue and red wavelength, but they really need they use a lot of other wavelengths. They can, but primarily the blue and red are the wavelengths that plants need most importantly. And human lights are not made for that, and they're just not. And so you need a plant, a light that's made for plants. We have a lot of good LED lights out there uh, that are designed for plants. There are also some uh, fluorescent type lights that are designed in a way that creates the wavelength that plants uh, need. So you need, you need that kind of lighting wavelength for plants to do their best. Now for transplants, uh, it is especially important to have the blue. Uh, the red is more important if you wanted to grow a tomato all the way to having fruit indoors, uh, you would need uh, some of the red as well. But uh, anyway, so you want to buy the quality of light. You need a light that is strong enough. Uh, it takes a certain amount of light brightness on the, on the foliage in order to provide the energy needed to support good health and, and vigor and growth. Uh, and what looks bright enough to you is probably not bright enough. The windowsill where we always start our plants is typically not bright enough, especially in the winter season. The sun's traveling low and the lighting is different. Uh, but uh, that's why I say you need to buy a light if you really want to have success starting your plants. So the amount of light is important. Now, for humans, we measure that in uh, lumens. You know, we say this light bulb has so many lumens. Well, that doesn't mean that it's producing a brightness that helps plants. And that's why I say they say uh, one of the statements is lumens are for humans, PAR is for plants. Uh, and PAR stands for photosynthesis synthetically active radiation. I should have given a nerd warning before today's show, <laughs> but I'm telling you this because it matters. And, and you'll find people trying to sell you plants, lights and stuff. You need, you need the PAR is important. You can find import, uh, uh, information on that. But you need enough of that light. So the way I like to describe it is think of rainfall. Uh, if you have a, just a misting little rainfall, that's nice, but it's not going to really wet the soil much. Uh, but if you have a good soaking amount of rainfall, 
that's going to provide the water that you need. Well, think of light in a somewhat similar way in that if you just have a light that's barely adequate, you're going to have to run that light longer to get the same amount of benefit in terms of energy production in the plant. Now, it doesn't mean you can take a crummy light and run it 24 hours. It just means uh, if you're close, just run it a little longer. And typically, we run our lights about 14 hours uh, when we're starting seedlings. And I get a timer, so I don't have to worry about it. It comes on, and it goes off each day. Plug the timer into the wall, and you're good to go. So we're talking about light quality, and we're talking about light quantity. Uh, I used to start my seedlings uh, with fluorescent bulbs, the kind like a shop light, the big, um, uh, what do they call them, T T12? Yeah, T12 fluorescent bulbs. And uh, those are kind of hard to find now. Uh, but we would always use a cool white and a warm white bulb because that would spread out the spectrum. It wouldn't be plant perfect by any means, but it would be adequate. But we would have to put that bulb down within a couple of inches of the plants uh, as they grew moving it up. It's hanging that shop light by a chain uh, because that's where we get the most light. Do you know that if you uh, double the distance that that shop light is from the plant that you would think, well, that's still just as bright. I mean, if you were looking at it with your eyes, you would say it's just as bright. In fact, you couldn't probably look at it with your eyes. Uh, but it, it makes the... Um, um, amount of ac actual light hitting the leaves uh, go down by half, I believe. Is in, in fact, I may be wrong about that formula, maybe even more than that. Uh, but anyway, that, that makes a difference. So getting the light close to the plant. Now, some of the new LEDs, they have a lot of a lot of temperature and heat and excessive light, and you can actually damage plants with excessive light. So that's something you're just going to have to kind of read about and figure out on your own. But light is the most important, and I spent a lot of time on that. Um, I, I also will say that uh, moisture is important at the right level. And so uh, uh, consistent moisture, not not drying out briefly and then you water it again, but consistent moisture, but not excessive moisture is important. If you keep it too wet, your seedlings are going to rot typically and die. If you let it dry out even briefly during the germination process, it will kill that developing seedling. So once it swells up with water and the biochemical stuff starts happening and the root comes out and then soon after that the the uh, top comes out if it dries out early in that process you are you're going to kill it and so you got to keep it consistent i will typically put uh, like a clear plastic over my seeds uh, if you if you want to go buy one of the trays with a solid a somewhat firm plastic cover over them, that's fine. Uh, you can also just get a dry cleaner bag and in your put something to hold the bag up off the top of the flat of seedlings that you planted. It could be a bent coat hanger stuck in one side and the other side. It could be popsicle sticks or something like that sticking up. But uh, you don't want that the wet plastic to sit on your, your plant leaves. But uh, that will also work and it keeps the humidity in. You don't have to water it every day or every other day that way uh, until they get larger plants that are pumping. And once the plants are up and getting going, then you can take it out of the bag and it'll do fine. But lighting and watering is really important. Now there are other factors in growing good plants and stuff. You want a good potting media. Uh, I typically recommend one that's made for seed starting. When you go to the store, you'll see this is seed starting media. Uh, you wouldn't want to use that for potting soil all the time, but uh, for seed starting, it works a little bit better, especially for tiny, tiny seeds. All right. Well, let's see. Uh, our phone number, 979-845-5689, 845-5689, or by email at gardensuccess at tamu dot edu, gardensuccess at tamu dot edu. Uh, and we will be very happy to visit with you, as will listeners that are tired of me getting nerdy about plant stuff <laughs> today. Oh, my gosh. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, leaves uh, because we are entering leaf season. Uh, this is the time, of course, when the tree leaves are dropping and your neighbors are kindly bagging them up and putting them at the curbside for you. That is such a, such a... Uh, 
uh, philanthropic thing that they do uh, for your garden and your landscape beds. Uh, of course, I'm joking about that, but I'm not joking about the fact that leaves are valuable, and they are valuable as mulch, they are valuable for making compost, and they can even be mixed into the soil uh, to improve the soil directly and decompose underground if you don't want to make compost with them. But let's talk about how we do that. Well, if you want to, to use leaves, I would recommend chopping them up a little bit. Now, if you're fortunate enough to have a leaf grinder or a branch trimmer kind of thing, that's even better. Uh, I don't. Uh, I just run over mine with a mower and uh, kind of blowing the clippings, and if there are any clippings left, and leaves toward the center, and you end up with something that's broken up a little bit. So if you use it as a mulch, it doesn't just blow right away, like the leaves that are out there on the lawn blowing around now. Uh, but uh, chopping them up a little would be step one for mulching. It also makes it better for composting because you increase the surface area of the leaf. Some leaves are very resistant to composting. Pine needles and uh, uh, magnolia leaves, even live oak leaves, uh, they've got a coating on them. And they don't break down as readily as if you chop them up a little bit. It just gives more surface area for the microbes to work and to get to them. So it speeds up your composting. You don't have to chop them for composting, but it speeds it up a little bit. If you're going to mix them into the soil, the same thing is true. Uh, if your leaves are larger, trying to rototill them or spade them into the soil, it's going to be very difficult. But if you've broken them up, that works fine. And by doing that during leaf season, which we're going to say is now through January, um, primarily, the um, uh, plants you're going to plant in your spring summer garden like tomatoes and peppers and squash and cucumbers they will have time for that uh, soil to be or for the, the tissues then the leaves to be completely decomposed now you've got organic matter in your soil you've got nutrients uh, the microbes are doing very well with all that to work on and it just makes for a better uh, soil better soil structure internally so what about if you collect the leaves and you have too much? And believe me, I collect a lot of leaves. I, <laughs> I, I won't even give you the number, but I, I collect a mound, a huge mountain of leaves in bags. Well, I, what am I going to do with that? Well, uh, in the bags, if you leave them sitting out all year, the sun is going to break down that plastic and you're going to have a mess on your hands. Uh, so uh, I will either store them underneath a tarp, uh, if you've got an out-of-the-way place to do that, uh, but another reason to grind them up even smaller, because instead of having a bazillion bags, you have a half a bazillion bags to to uh, store up. Uh, some people make big wire rings, maybe six feet across, or depending on how many leaves you have, or more, uh, and then they fill up those wire rings with leaves and let them just sit there. They're going to decompose a little bit, but not a whole lot. And uh, maybe you'll get a little more toward that leaf mold stage, the chocolatey, crumbly leaf that's not really composted yet completely. But by storing them like that, then next July and August, when, oh my, you really need the mulch, uh, then that would be a time where they would still be around. So I realize for a lot of you that is not going to be practical, uh, that you know, or you don't have a spot for it, or the, if you put them somewhere that'd be visible and the neighborhood association would start writing you letters. I get all that. Uh, but try to do as much as you can in terms of keeping and using these leaves. They're very valuable. They have nutrients that the tree take, took up, and they're free organic matter. Just like using your clippings is important by returning them to the lawn, using your leaves is important too. And by the way, if you just have a light covering of leaves, or if you regularly go out, you can use a mulching mower, chop them up, and in a St. Augustine lawn, which is a very loose, open type of growth habit compared to a golf course green, for example, uh, in a St. typical St. Augustine lawn, mowing over them with a good mulching mower, they disappear. They go right down to the surface, and they will decompose down there. Uh, and I have I've had leaves so thick that you could not see the lawn, and they mulch right away. It's like you're vacuuming them up when you go over them with that mower. So that would be another option that you certainly could use uh, if you just don't want to give away that free uh, um, slow release organic matter and nutrients that are present there with those leaves. 
Uh, let's see, that was uh, talking about uh, the leaves. Oh, one, one other thing. Sometimes I get questions about what if the trees had diseases like fungal leaf spots or bacterial spots on the leaves? Well, I'll just say, you know, you can never say uh, something that has no exceptions. It's very difficult to. But uh, I will say, by and large, uh, without enough of an exception to have a concern for you, don't worry about it. Uh, number one, if you compost them, that process is going to deal with the, a lot of the disease right there, especially if it heats up well. Uh, but the diseases that your trees get are typically not going to be the diseases that your flowers and your vegetables or your herbs and for the most part your shrubs underneath are going to get. In fact, two different species don't typically share the same disease in most cases. So your rose can get powdery mildew, uh, your uh, Turk's cap can get powdery mildew, and your crepe myrtles, if they're not resistant varieties, can get powdery mildew. But the powdery mildew from your crepe myrtle is not going to infect your rose. It's a different strain, and you don't have to worry about that. So get the leaves and use them. And, and think about it this way. If that was a big concern, uh, even and it, I guess disease wise it could be to the tree itself because the disease got on that tree but then the forest would just be all a diseased mess because they're dropping their leaves right under them and just leaving them there certainly not composting them that immediately uh, and so that's a, just another indication that hey let's not worry about this it's going to be fine so hopefully that will will uh, give you some things to to think about our phone number is 979-845-5689, 979-845-5689. Uh, we had an email, which is gardensuccess at tamu.edu. Uh, we had an email come in from Wes asking about, is there a place around this area to buy pine straw for landscaping? Well, if you're listening, please call in and let me know where that is. I think I may have seen it before, but I can't really remember what that where that is. Uh, I know that pine straw can be purchased and, and brought in by garden centers if they choose to do that. Typically, people aren't real thrilled about buying it and using it. Uh, it's always been interesting to me that in areas where there are lots of pine trees, like Georgia, for example, uh, some of the southern forests, they literally bag or they literally harvest and bale the pine needles to ship west and sell to people who want to buy them. And they despise pine needles in their yards and bed. They, they don't want to use them. But then you come out west and people are buying them to bring them in, uh, which, you know, it's fine. I just don't know anyone that's selling them locally. There may be. I suspect there, there probably uh, is. Uh, let's see, uh, we wanted to, oh, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, vegetable gardening and planting and flower gardening and planting uh, at this time of year. Well, we're, we're kind of in a month, and if you look at our vegetable garden planting calendar chart that's on the Master Gardener website, uh, the December is a month where there's no dark green. We've got white, which means don't plant it now. We've got light green, which means you can plant it now. It's not the best time. And then we have dark green, which means prime time. Well, we got some light green, but that's about as far as it gets. So you can continue planting all of your cool season crops like the cruciferous vegetables or the coal crops, and that would include um, broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, kohlrabi, kale, collards, uh, Brussels sprouts and so on. Mustard is a is also a cruciferous vegetable. Uh, you could plant those. You could plant your cool season greens that are things like lettuce and spinach, for example, uh, at this point in time. Uh, and there there are some other things that you can plant. Uh, some of the the root crops, uh, radish and turnip, for example, and carrots uh, could be planted, and uh, they, they'll do they'll do okay in this in this cool season. But when we have a real hard freeze, you're going to have to cover those up uh, just to protect them, especially the tender little seedlings. Uh, but you can keep planting them during this time. When we get into January, first of the year, that's when we really start uh, planting all of those cool season vegetables again. But we have a lot of the prime time for them then. And the reason for that difference is that 
let's say broccoli. We typically plant it September, mid-September through mid-October being the, the best time uh, to plant it. And that broccoli plant will grow very well in the milder days of mid, after mid-October, for example, uh, and November when it really gets milder. Uh, and so you end up getting a good harvest, a bigger plant and a better harvest a little earlier. If you plant broccoli now, it's not going to grow as much or as fast, but it will grow and you can keep it alive and get it to grow. But then in spring, we get that thing again where we plant it and it's going to be warming up pretty soon. February has some pretty nice days uh, in, in our typical climate. And uh, so you can get a, a good crop again at that point in time. So if you don't have if you want to grow your own seeds, now is a good time to, to find them. Our gar local garden centers often have seeds, uh, or do always have seeds available uh, that you can purchase for planting. If you can't find the variety you want, uh, you may have to go to an online seed catalog and be able to order there. But do that now also, because at some point, if it's going to be real popular, it'll sell out and uh, then you won't be able to get it at that time. So now's a good time to shop for those kind of things. Uh, it's also a good time to shop for your, your grow light that I was talking about and the trays and the soils and whatnot. So you're ready to go. Uh, and that way, when you're sitting there looking outside on a miserable January day with cold and a little drizzle, uh, you can enjoy inside gardening as you get ready for that wonderful summer garden and that tomato that you can almost already taste. Uh, so that's important. It's also important now, uh, if you are going to uh, test your soil, go ahead and get it done so you can get the results in and make the amendments. Uh, if you uh, are not doing the soil testing, maybe you've already done that and you know where you are, but you're wanting to add compost or rototill some leaves in, like I mentioned, uh, now's a good time to do it because it gives it a lot of time to break down. Uh, in the cool, cool soil, microbial activity slows down, but it doesn't stop. Uh, and uh, it, and uh, you can have those leaves or that compost, um, comp you know, broken down. You can do the improvements to your soil structure now so that when it's time to plant, you're ready to go. Now, we've kind of hit the point where our soils tend to stay wet almost all the time uh, in the winter. So uh, we look for periods in the fall when we can do our soil prep, when it's dry enough to work the soil. But you'll just have to kind of wait for a period like that to, to, to make your beds or do whatever kind of changes uh, you're going to do to them. But take advantage of the time to make those purchases and to do that kinds of preparation um, that before uh, it's time to actually plant. Uh, that I had a uh, kind of follow up on a question uh, from Tad, and we were talking about Tad's doing some construction uh, and is concerned about some of the trees and, and how to protect them. Uh, and so uh, one of his concerns is regarding the feeder root area to protect uh, and the area that, uh, for example, might get, uh, you might move a trench through it that would cut roots or you might put a concrete driveway or a walkway over the top of it. Um, you know, that, that sort of thing. Or maybe it's vehicle traffic moving in to bring in supplies uh, for building and the, the pickup or whatever is going back and forth over it. Uh, it's primarily um, um, important to protect the area beneath the branch spread of the tree. So as far as the branches reach out, and I realize the tree is irregular, it's not exactly the same, but just imagine a circle that's about as far as the branches reach out. And if you can protect that area, you're going to be okay uh, uh, for your trees. If you have to get inside that area, uh, especially with a trench that cuts across, then you're going to lose a lot of roots and you're going to have some issues. Uh, but when that happens, at least protect the trunk against uh, bumper blight from vehicles bumping against it, which happens, uh, or um, protect the soil from compaction by putting down either a real thick 
bed of wood chips like the stuff they grind up and blow into the back of the truck when they're doing tree trimming, uh, you know, or, or that kind of work. Uh, you can have that dumped and in many cases, depending on where you live, they may just dump it for you and let you let you spread it around on the under that tree. That sort of acts as a, a cushion to prevent or reduce soil compaction. Some people will use a good thick plywood and lay it down uh, and just let the trucks go over that area. And I know that costs money to do that, but we're talking about valuable trees, so you decide. Uh, but anyway, that that would be pretty important. Uh, the further out you get, the better. The further away you can keep all of that kind of stuff, uh, the better it is. So. That is what I would recommend on any kind of construction that you're going to be doing and with trees. If you are fortunate enough to buy a lot of land that has beautiful trees on it and you want to build a house in it, building among the trees is tough and you want to be careful. It easily can be done if you do the right things, though. So the worst thing that happens, and believe me, I've seen this often, not often, but occasionally, is someone will go in and build a house right around or near these big, beautiful trees and they are just imagining the beauty and the shade and all that and the construction causes it to die, the tree to die and now you're spending a lot more money because you're taking limbs off that are hanging over a house uh, and you know, that's down the line but that could be prevented in most cases by uh, someone who knows what they're doing. And you can always call me at the AgriLife Extension office, uh, look at some pictures of your project. We can talk about things that can be done or hire a certified arborist uh, to come out and do an assessment and give the recommendations and the consulting job. Uh, and that is well worth the money uh, to do when you think about the value of the trees and not just the value of the trees, but the importance to the aesthetics uh, and even the air conditioning temperature if you're wanting it to help shade your roof and cut down on, on that a little bit. Boy, we're talking about a wide range of things today, uh, but uh, if you want to give us a call, it's 979-845-5689, 845-5689, or by Garden Success at Gar or excuse me, I'll write email at garden success at tamu dot edu. Garden success at tamu dot edu. Also mentioned that I was going to talk about flowers, so let's uh, let's do that. Uh, our cool season flowers uh, are a way to kind of get the winter doldrums uh, to, to go away and enjoy some beauty during the cool season. Uh, there are a lot of wonderful warm season flowers, but when it gets cold, we still want to have some color. So uh, we have a number of flowers that are marginally hardy, and they will help us in the cooler seasons, but not in the coldest cold. They, you, they're going to have to be covered up for that. And that would include things, uh, snapdragons are that way, uh, stock, uh, the the plant called stock, a uh, flowering plant, uh, is that way. Calendula, uh, the uh, alyssums, I'm sure I'm forgetting several important good ones, but uh, those kinds of things can grow through the cool season, but they're going to need some protection when it really gets cold, well below freezing. The uh, hardier things would be things like ornamental cabbage and kale, and these are the ones that they sort of look like uh, ornamental, they look like uh, kale in the plant growth habit, uh, but they will have, in addition to the bluish green leaves, they will have beautiful magenta uh, to uh, pinkish, uh, purplish colors in them, depending on the variety, and even white, uh, beautiful white. Uh, and so they're quite ornamental as they are. Some of them even will uh, bloom in the spring and send up a tall stalk with yellow flowers that I think is really beautiful. So you can leave them around a little extra long for that. They're very cold hardy. They do very well. Uh, they have the same issues that uh, our vegetable cruciferous uh, uh, crops do, and that would be things like looper caterpillars, for example. Uh, I think black rot uh, that affects the foliage can affect them as well. So the other thing are the pansies and, and the violas. Pansies and violas are very cold hardy. Uh, pansies are beautiful. They got bigger flowers. Violas have smaller flowers. I prefer the violas because after a rainstorm, the pansies get pretty beat up. 
but the violas don't as much. And they produce so many flowers that it's hard to even see the foliage. Uh, and you can pick them in individual colors. So if you want one that's a couple of shades of blue or a couple of shades of orange, for example, you can have that and you can combine those colors in the way that you want to. And uh, just want to make sure they all these things have adequate nutrition during the cool season. That doesn't mean a big dose of fertilizer. It just means a little boost, especially nitrogen, uh, during the cool season here and there to keep them vigorous. Uh, remember that our modern varieties are bred to bloom, 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 and they'll literally bloom themselves to death, just about. Uh, I see that with uh, petunias as well. Uh, we're cutting them back a little bit. Uh, and getting some new fresh growth and foliage, that's where the nitrogen helps out. Some vigor uh, will get you a new set of blooms on, on some of these things that, that uh, will help keep that season going. But don't uh, let the winter go by without enjoying uh, some cool season color. And Dusty Miller, by the way, is silvery and looks really good with bluish colored uh, violas, for example. Uh, and it's pretty cold hardy, too. It kind of goes in the first group, though, uh, not completely cold hardy. Uh, but that would be another one that would give you uh, some beauty uh, as well. Uh, let's see, I also wanted to mention uh, that we were talking about the nutrients in the vegetable gardens. That is also important. Uh, small amounts of nitrogen and nutrients periodically to keep those things growing, with the exception of cool season peas. And over, you don't want to overdo it on your root crops, such as carrots, for example. And you get a lot of top growth at the expense of root development. Uh, crowding and excessive nitrogen can both cause the spindly little things that never developed a good carrot, for example, for you. So be a little careful uh, when you're using those out there. Well, I hope you enjoy yourself out in the garden. Uh, get out and get these things done this week before it gets really cold next week. Uh, have a good weekend out in the garden. We look forward to talking to you each week on Garden Success. Uh, tell your friends about the show from 12 to noon every Thursday, and you can also listen to us online. You can listen to past shows online, and we now are available on a number of the different podcast providers where you can listen to past shows, even driving down the road in your car. See you next week. You've been listening to Garden Success with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist Skip Richter. Join us again next week as Skip discusses your questions about gardening and landscaping in the Brazos Valley.